Hi there, and welcome to The Artist's Craft. I'm your host, Stacey Cochran, and we have an outstanding show for this week. Joining us from Wilmington is publisher and author Jack Fryer, and also joining us on the studio set today is Suzanne Adair, who is the author of Paper Woman, published with Jack's publisher, as well as another book called The Blacksmith's Daughter. Have a copy of that here as well. Uh, thank you very much for being on the show. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, Paper Woman. Who is Sophie Barton? Sophie Barton is the main character in Paper Woman. And what is her story? What is her, what is her background? Sophie runs her father's printing press. And her father is allied with the Patriots. And this takes place during the Revolutionary War. And he disappears, and they suspect it's been a murder. And Sophie just wants to be neutral. But the British do not want to investigate um, the murder of someone who they suspect is a patriot. Hmm. So Sophie decides she has to do the investigation herself. And uh, so how, what, what is the process like writing historical fiction? One of the things that I'm really fascinated by about this book is the amount of research that probably went into it. Can you talk a little bit about that? A lot of research, as you can imagine. Not just um, reading what's out there in terms of primary and secondary research and talking to subject matter experts, but I found when I began to write this that here I am, a woman of the 21st century, and there's no way that I could adequately imagine what these people were having to, to put up with in terms of their clothing, you know, the smells, the sights, the weather, you know, all the difficulties that they had to undergo. So that is when I got into Revolutionary War reenacting and um, joined a unit, the 33rd Light Company of Foot, and actually went out on weekends and did reenacting with them to see what does it feel like to be in a petticoat, uh, wearing wool, uh, 100 degree days, you know, having to put up with winter weather, sleeping in a canvas army tent, that sort of thing, and cooking over an open fire. And those experiences have given me a lot more to write from than, than just reading or talking to subject matter experts. How do you think we would do living in now the, the 21st century if somebody could take a time shuttle back to that period and we're, we have all these modern conveniences here in the, in the U.S., how would, how would a person do in that time period? Well, I think most of us would probably squeal a lot. We, we would be deprived of so many things, um, instant communication, refrigeration, um, even when a rainstorm hits, having no shelter, you know, we would, we would have a very difficult time with it. And then there's the diseases that occurred during that time. We have antibiotics and um, immunizations today, and then they had to just gut it out back then. Hmm. Now, who is Lieutenant Dunstan Fairfax? Oh, he's a villain that runs through my entire series. He's uh, actually a British officer. And. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about Paper Woman? Tell us a little bit about the story. you got Sophie Barton, uh, who is the daughter of a newspaper man, right, who is, uh, he sides with, with the colonists, or is that sort of ambiguous, whether he does or it's, not? It's pretty obvious that that's what his side is. So, so he comes under the uh, suspicion of, of the British, right? Right. And he is... Um, the background behind it is that he is trying to work in alliance with the Spanish court um, because the Spanish were actually they came into the war later into the war um, 1779 or so and he's trying to work in alliance with the Spanish court and he winds up I don't want to give away the plot but um, Sophie winds up having to follow him through the Caribbean, hmm. his trail that, that he leaves. Now, how many of these places in the novel were you able to actually visit in doing some of the research for Paper Woman? Well, where it starts uh, is a fictitious town called Alton, Georgia. But there are plenty of places along coastal Georgia that actually did exist that I have my characters travel through, as well as uh, Cal Ford, which is now called Jacksonville, Florida, and St. Augustine, Florida. And then my characters also go to the Bahamas, and they go to Havana, Cuba. And those were all actually important. The Caribbean and, and Cuba was all important in the Revolutionary War as part of the Southern theater, but we just don't know about it. It's, you know, the focus has been mostly on the North when we talk about this war. Hmm. Now you say that uh, 
Dunstan Fairfax is in both of these novels. He runs through the series. Are there novels to come beyond The Blacksmith's Daughter? The next one, the third one, is called Camp Follower, and he's in that one also. Well, I don't know how well you can see this at home, but we have a copy of both Paper Woman and The Blacksmith's Daughter, uh, which are published with Whitler's Bench Press. So, is he the only character that shows up in the second novel? No. From no, the first I, book? I take characters, um, and some of the ones that were important in the first book are, are maybe secondary characters in the second book and the third book, and then some that were secondary characters in the first book come to the forefront in later books. And um, I work it like that. That's, that's the way that I have a series. Is it more comfortable? Was it more comfortable writing the second book because you kind of knew these characters? You knew the environment a little bit more? Definitely. Hmm. I had I already had my world established by then and I was becoming very comfortable at that point with uh, the whole Revolutionary War environment. Hmm. Very cool. Well, we also have Jack here who is sitting patiently uh, listening to the conversation. And Jack is the publisher of Whitler's Bench Press and Dramtree Books as right. well. One of the things that I think is really fascinating about having both the author of the book and her publisher on set is we can talk about some of the dynamic between author and publisher. I know a lot of our audience is composed of aspiring writers and there's this big mystery of well how do I act around my publisher and how often do I send them emails and should I call and how do you initiate contact. Uh, what are some of the biggest challenges for you Jack as as a publisher of a small press? Well as a small press I'm not random house. I don't have a sales staff and a publicity department. I'm, I wear pretty much all the hats mm -hmm. with Whitler's Bench and Dram Tree Books. And so the biggest challenge with working with other authors is getting them to understand the business side of this. You know, mm -hmm. I, I told one of the first things I told Suzanne and I tell everybody that I publish is that uh, you're an author, once the book is published, you're an author only in so much as it gives you an excuse to put a book in someone's hands and possibly get make a sale out of it. What you really are once the book is published is a bookseller. And you know, too many people that write a book are you know, of a mindset that once the book is out there they'll sit back and the adoring public is going to come beat down their door to you know, buy a copy of their, their great work. And that's just not the way it is. You know, I wish all of the authors I ever work with hustle as much as Suzanne does to, to make their books a success um, because she really does get out there and beat the bushes and, and work hard to make people aware that, of what she's got to sell. Well, I think it's an excellent point to make. Uh, you know, you really do, as, a, as an author, you have a responsibility. It's a business partnership as much as anything with a publisher and you're both in it together and the, the books aren't going to sell on their own. That's you know, right. You have to get out there and, and hustle them a little bit. Was that, I, I take it from what you're saying, that that was not news to you though? No, it was not. I knew I would have to get out there and hustle and, and I was in a position where I could do so. I had been doing a lot of research well in advance of ever meeting Jack, mm. so I, I knew where to go mm. to sell. What are some pointers or tips that you could give to aspiring writers? After the book is published, what are some things that they should be thinking about in terms of marketing the book? Uh, they need to be connected. Uh, authors, associations, um, I'm a mystery writer, so I would say Mystery Writers of America, Sisters in Crime, that sort of thing. Um, North Carolina Writers Network here in, in this state. Uh, they need to stay connected, um, plugged in with other authors. You can also go online. There are many discussion lists branching off of, of these different associations and organizations. Um, talk to booksellers, especially independent booksellers. Uh, when you're with a small press, they are much more inclined to hand sell your book. And you talk with them about perhaps setting up signings, uh, especially panels with other authors sure. and you know they're delighted to work with you mm -hmm. things like that and and speaking of working with independent public or independent booksellers as well I'll toss it over to you Jack having a small press it seems like your demographic is largely in in the Carolinas Virginia uh, South Carolina and Georgia what are some ways as a publisher you're connecting with the booksellers in those communities 
My market is primarily North Carolina. Dramtree Books and Whitler's Bench Press titles, even though they're available to Books and Me and in Barnes and Noble and, and the larger chains like that, uh, we sell most of our books in, in outlets other than bookstores. Um, the uh, you know, museums, historic sites, gift shops, places like that. Uh, the uh, we actually sell more books there than we do anywhere else. Um, but one of the things that I do is is twice a year I get out on the road and and the new books I actually travel around and put them in the booksellers hands and say this is a cool one you're gonna like this or this is a demographic you know this is an audience that'll that'll enjoy this book um, the uh, you know the thing that we try to do is is establish a relationship with the people that are trying to sell our books and, and find out what we have to do for them to make their job easier. Uh, because just as the relationship between Suzanne and I is a partnership, my relationship with the people that try to sell my books is a partnership as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's very symbiotic. Hmm. Well, if you're just tuning in, the guests today are Suzanne Adair, who is the author of The Blacksmith's Daughter and Paper Woman, and her publisher, Jack Fryer, who is an author as well. Let's turn to uh, the blacksmith's daughter a little bit. Uh, so talk a little bit about, uh, if you would, Suzanne, uh, the blacksmith's daughter. What is the story there without giving too much of it away? That picks up with Betsy Sheridan, who is the daughter of Sophie Barton. And Betsy's husband, uh, Betsy, Betsy lives in Augusta, Georgia, and her husband seems to be involved in some shady dealings. And it looks like he, on the surface, that he is loyal to the crown, but then she comes across some evidence that makes it look as though he's actually with the Patriots and he's spying. Hmm. And she winds up um, having to follow him to Camden and gets involved in the Battle of Camden there, which was in August of 1780. Very cool. Now, she's pregnant in the novel as well, is that right? That's right. What are some of the obstacles she faces being a pregnant young woman in that time period? Oh, um, some of the similar obstacles that you know a woman would face nowadays. Um, she, of course, has to, especially as she gets toward the end of her pregnancy, she has to rest, but that's, that's when the, the Battle of Camden is coming about. Um, just the, the whole general environment of having to take care of herself and her baby but she's caught up in things that are bigger than she is and so how do you do that you know that that sort of thing hmm. awesome well the books are the blacksmith's daughter and paper woman uh, we're going to be tossing it over to natasha gilliam who has an excellent book review for this week uh, natasha is reviewing uh, john grisham's latest uh, best-selling novel the appeal which is of course one of his legal thrillers uh, and then we'll bring it back over and talk a little bit more about The Blacksmith's Daughter and Paper Woman with the author uh, Suzanne Adair and Jack Fryer, her publisher. Uh, so take it away, Natasha. All right, Stacey, The Appeal, written by John Grisham, is about the corruption of a big corporation and the havoc it causes in the small town of Bomer, Mississippi. John Grisham deserves nothing but excellent reviews. Grisham is extraordinary in the way he articulates this novel. He is also clear and concise in the way he portrays both the protagonist and the antagonist of the novel. Mary Grace and Wes Payton of Payton and Payton Law Firm are the protagonists of the novel. They are two struggling lawyers willing to defend Jeanette Baker in her fight against multi-billion dollar Crane Chemical, a major corporation accused of illegally dumping toxic waste causing cancer related deaths and illnesses. Now Peyton and Peyton Law Firm is literally bankrupt finding it hard to even support their own family as they fight Crane Chemical. Finally after months of trial they received a verdict of 41 million dollars. Short lived the verdict is only the beginning. The pill sets the courtroom drama into action. Headed for the Supreme Court, Carl Trudeau, the face behind Crane Chemical, becomes ruthless. A man of politics and dirty tactics, Carl Trudeau constructs a scheme that will not let justice prevail. Now, John Grisham actually began writing popular fiction when he was 35 years old. A former lawyer, he gathers his inspiration from actual courtroom experiences. He has written such novels as A Time to Kill and The Firm. John Grisham is passionate in his approach to justice. You should definitely read this novel. Back to you, Stacy. Thank you very much, Natasha. So the guests that we have in studio today are Suzanne Adair, author of The Paper Woman, uh, or just Paper Woman, and 
also the book The Blacksmith's Daughter. Uh, well, both of these books are historically set and the uh, research that went into them sounds significant. What would you say, Suzanne, is the key to writing great historical fiction? What I think has helped me the most has been my experience reenacting, mm -hmm. simply because it allows me uh, to the sensory impressions that we don't get here in the 21st century. Hmm. Very cool. Now, Jack, being the publisher of Dramtree Books and, and uh, Whitler's Bench Press, uh, what are some of the things that an author can do in initiating contact with a publisher to, to really get off on the right foot? Well, even a small publisher like me, we're inundated with, with manuscripts, and we have, we have so many demands on our time. The first thing I look for is someone who appreciates that in, in a submission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I ask for material, I want uh, maybe the first three chapters, a brief outline of, of your book to make sure you know what's going to happen after those first three chapters, and a little bit of a letter telling me something about yourself that, that you know, lets me know whether or not you've got the chops to, to pull off the book you're trying to write. Suzanne did all of those things. Uh, beyond that, we want a book that's, that's going to first and foremost tell a captivating story. Uh, and then secondly, you know, almost as important, is, is a book that's historical accurate. You can't have uh, the Americans winning at the Battle of Camden or, or the South winning at Gettysburg or something like that. Uh, yeah, it, all of the action that you have in your book, all of the things that happen have to be within the realm of possibility. And uh, because, you know, Whitler's Bench is our fiction side, but Dramtree Books, the parent company, is nonfiction history. And so that's one of the things that we're sticklers for is, is you know, historical accuracy. And Suzanne was able to bring all of that to the table. It's really an amazing story. And I'm fascinated by that dynamic between publisher and, and author. Uh, Suzanne, what were some of the things that you did to worry and I'm fascinated with that dynamic between publisher and, and author. Uh, Suzanne, what were some of the things um, that you did to... I sought out an independent editor before I brought my manuscript to Jack hmm. and he helped me trim about a third from the wow. book and tighten the suspense. I talked with Jack about a year later about that and he said that if I had brought him the book in the original form he would have said well this is a good book but it's too much book and I think a lot of writers are afraid to to go ahead and, and seek out an independent editor they've been told your publisher is going to provide you with an editor but if you've got something that's got too many words and it hides you know your your story mm -hmm. then it, I think it's really your responsibility to get in there and trim it down. Well, one of the challenges, though, and I'm sure you're aware of this, for aspiring writers is in working with, uh, with an independent editor, hiring an editor to, to, to you know, really hone their book and, and, and whittle it to the best possible shape that it can be, is they're afraid of the scam artists and these kinds of things. What were some things that you did to find an editor that worked in the best possible way for your books? This was actually, the fellow that, that I have used uh, was recommended to me by several people. Uh, I see. So I had, so I think recommendations certainly, hmm. you know, they, they go a long way. You have to talk with people that have used this person before and find out, well, what are they like? Mm -hmm. You know, that sort of thing. And a good starting point for, for finding someone like that is organizations like the North Carolina Writers exactly. Network. You know, they're, the Writers Network is a clearinghouse of information for, for writers, you know, and that's, that would certainly be a, a, a good place to start a search mm -hmm. like that. Where would you say your love of history came from? I've always loved history. I grew up in South Florida, and in Florida, you get the impression that history started with Henry Flagler, but it didn't. You find out as you dig more that it went way back into the 1500s with the Spaniards that came in and settled in St. Augustine. And St. Augustine is even older than Jamestown. And I find that all just very fascinating. So uh, I was willing to just sort of bide my time and, and wait and find a way that I could bring Florida into the, the historical scope of things, which is what I've done in Paper Woman. Was there a moment in, in your childhood, in your youth, where the light of history really kind of came on for you, or has it just always been there? Is there one significant moment that you can look back and say, hey, that's what really made me aware of how history is important to us, and it's fascinating as well? 
I can't say that there was a particular moment. I, I've always been interested in, in a number of different things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, certainly Florida's history while I was growing up there captivated me every bit as much as, uh, say, the space program, hmm. which was active down at, at that time, the Apollo missions and so forth. Fascinating. Well, if you're just tuning in, the guests today are authors uh, Suzanne Adair and her publisher Jack Fryer, who is an author as well. Uh, the press is Dram Tree Books and specifically uh, Whitler's Bench Press, which is the fiction imprint right. uh, for, for Dram Tree Books. Uh, they have a website, I believe it's DramTreeBooks.com. That's right. Uh, you can check that out if you're interested in, in seeing the other books. What would you say is the publishing mission of Dram Tree Books and Whitler's Bench Press? Uh, to buy my groceries? No. <laughs> no yeah, we. Uh, but like, what is the focus? I mean, we focus primarily. Want... Yeah, as a small guy, I can't compete with the big boys. You know, like Random House, or even within our own state. You know, uh, companies like John Blair or, or Algonquin. Um, so, if you're a small publisher like me, what you've got to do is is find a niche that you can do better than they can. Um, the guys in New York might carry all the John Grisham novels in the world, but they can't do North Carolina history the way I can. Um, the books that I do focus on the four centuries of great history that North Carolina has. Uh, we've got everything from lost colonies and Indian wars to pirates and, and you know, all the way up to space shuttle astronauts. So there's plenty of material to work with there. And because we're not going to sell a whole lot of North Carolina history books in Nebraska, you know, I can focus on a territory that, that's easy for me to cover myself. So we do books built around the history of the Carolinas and the fiction side of it. We do books that are uh, historical fiction you know, with a North Carolina tie-in. Uh, we also do uh, mysteries and, and humorous novels, or we're open to those kinds of books, but all of our books have to have a North Carolina tie-in. Um, so that's our mission is to, uh, on the nonfiction side, make people aware of the great stories we've got in this state, and on the fiction side, uh, tell you a good story that'll leave you feeling satisfied when you put it down. Well, that's an awesome story. Uh, you know, I, I was just reading just yesterday about a press called, I think it was Lions Press, which was then bought out by Globe Pequot, mm -hmm. uh, if that's pronounced right. Uh, and then recently, they've just in the past few days been purchased as well by a huge company. Uh, do you, are you comfortable with the size of the press now, or would you, could it get to the point where it was successful enough that you would try to? Yeah. Dram Tree Books started out as a, as a means of, of publishing my own work and then not too long after that I started taking on other people's work as well and uh, we put our first book out in 2002 and this Christmas we'll have 33 books in print uh, and I'm a one-man show I do everything except put them on the press uh, so yeah the potential is there to to grow larger uh, my books are, are carried in, in over 200 sites in North Carolina South Carolina Virginia and Georgia, um, but it could be a lot bigger. Uh, but I'm going right now. Dram Tree Books, uh, meaning me, are going through the uh, the growing pains of of you know, where you reach a point of marginal diminishing returns. Say. So you've got one book out there and it takes, for the sake of argument, 20 hours a week to do all the things you need to do to make it successful, all the publicity and marketing and everything else. Well, you can do that with one book. You can even do it with two or three. But like I said, by Christmas we'll have 33 in print and you reach a point of marginal diminishing returns where there's just not enough time for one man to do everything that needs to be done. So I see a small business loan looming in my future you know, to, to hire in somebody else to, to help with the workload. You know, even, you know, even something as simple as calling our vendors once a month and saying, hey, this is Bob from Dramtree. You know, do you need more of Suzanne's books? Or we've got a new one coming out this spring that you're really going to like. You know, so simple things like that. Um, but the company will, will grow. You know, it will be there. I'll do what I have to do to, to make it a viable company that, that's a, you know, a, a player in, in the marketplace. How did you first get into books and, and publishing? I, I noticed from the website it dates back to the early to mid 1990s. Was, right. Was there were you interested in books in terms of the process earlier than that, or what was it that you said okay? I've I've always been a writer and publisher. You know, it started with school newspapers. You know, when I was coming up, uh, and as an adult, I've been good at two things in my life. I was a pretty good marine, and I'm I'm pretty good with ink and paper. Uh, I've worked in bookstores. You know, everything from you know sales clerk in a Walden Books to uh, you know an independent store manager to you know a publisher's rep. 
and uh, you know I start when I finally got completely out of the military I was looking for something to do and I started doing monthly magazines down around the Wilmington area and one of those was called the Coastal Chronicles where what we did was we told true factually accurate stories about the history of the Cape Fear and the coast but we tried to write it the way a fiction writer or a storyteller would mm. there's no reason a true story has to be a dull story you know well we were doing 10,000 copies a month and we put them on the streets and they were gone in five to seven days um, the school teachers were calling to pick up back issues to get the stories they missed because they were actually using them as teaching aids in the classrooms well at the time there was another Another small press in Wilmington called Coastal Carolina Press and they told me when we got enough of these stories together they'd be interested in doing it as a book and I mentioned this to Ellen Beige who is a, a well-known writer in the Wilmington area um, uh, who also ran a company called Banks Channel Books her own small publishing imprint and when I mentioned it to her she said Jack why would you uh, let somebody else do it and you get maybe a buck a copy royalty when you can do it yourself and, and keep it all and I got to thinking yeah, why would I do that? <laughs> because doing the magazines, you know, the, the process of putting a book together physically is not a whole lot different from doing magazines. And having worked in the book industry, I knew how it worked. And as I said, we don't sell a lot of these in the Midwest. So North Carolina is my primary market. I don't need a big distribution network. So uh, the first book we did was a collection of the stories from Coastal Chronicles magazine on the Coastal Chronicles volume one. And uh, like I said, since then we've, we've done 20 some odd books more and by Christmas it'll be 33. So. It's an amazing story. You hear so much about the demise of, of traditional publishing to hear somebody who is out there working it really to, to, to create a niche market. Now, you've got a niche market for your books and it's, it sounds like you're really beginning to, to have things take off for you. It's People really enjoy the books that we do. I mean, you know, we, it's easy. We've got great stories to tell in this state. And, and if, you, if you tell a great story, there's a voracious appetite for it. For, for Dram Tree Books and, and to a lesser extent Whitler's Bench Press, um, there's, there's three different kinds of readers for our books. Uh, the first one is, is native North Carolinians. Uh, for native born Southerners, who we were is a big part of who we are. You know, our, our history is very much our DNA as a people. And so you know, you've got a market there. The, the second prong of that triumvirate is uh, newcomers to the area. You know, part of the process of assimilating into a new community is learning the history of it. And then the third is the tourists. You know, tourists come here, or at least to the Cape Fear area where we're from, uh, we draw more money from historical tourism than we do from any other kind of tourism. So there's a market for it there. So when I'm going to publish a book, I ask myself, who's going to read it? And if I can say that two of those three audiences will, will read this book, then it's probably going to get a, a favorable you know, reception by me. Well, that's absolutely an awesome story, and it sounds like uh, you had a, a great focus on this. We're just about out of time here at The Artist Craft, but I want to remind everybody that the books are Paper Woman, the author is Suzanne Adair, and the other book, which is in the series, is The Blacksmith's Daughter, and the upcoming book, what's the title of it? Camp Follower. Camp Follower. Uh, you can buy these books at dramtreebooks.com and I believe you have a website, SuzanneAdair.com as well. I'd like to thank you both for, for taking the time out of your day to join us here in studio. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. And thank you all for tuning in. For all of us at The Artist Craft and RTN Channel 10, we thank you for tuning in. Thanks so much.